sit down and talk to this lady. You may have heard uh, Sean O'Rourke the other morning, or may not, because you're probably listening to Joe Finnegan on Shannon Side North Sound or Ocean <laughs> FM. So the good thing about that is that we have her here. How are you, Kristen? I'm great. Kristen O'Reilly, who yeah. is a mental health nurse. Welcome, our ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Now, you'll have to look at the screen now. This is where we get all real techie here. Kirsten, um, Hubert told me a story about you. Uh, <laughs> well, he told me lots of stories about you. I don't even want to oh, go share tonight. Don't, don't go anyway. too far now. <laughs> um, we, you're here to talk about resilience. And uh, he, he told me about that he had you, you were traveling around with him uh, uh, when you were training or whatever. And he was going to schools to talk to kids about you know, positive mental attitude, you know, the kind of incredible work that Hubert uh, does and mm -hmm. Valerie does all the time. And um, you said to him, oh, oh, well, I'm going to talk to the kids as well. And he said, well, well what do you want to talk about? She said, oh, I'm just going to talk about my life. Now, I read your piece in the Irish Times. I was reappraising it, or rereading it there for myself there now. Remind us, this story starts with your lovely dad. It does. It starts for, I'm going to be speaking in plural because I was never alone throughout this. There's six of us, um, five girls and a boy. And where are you from, just to remind you? Oh, Giva, about Giva. Uh, half hour away from here. So Not from Leitrim, but we support you. That's common, yeah, okay. It's, it's Sligo. Sligo. It's Sligo. It's on right. the border. It was worse if you were a Rossi, so it's fine. It's fine. Okay. We will. <laughs> so um, it was, our story kind of started back in 2013. And um, our daddy had spent a summer kind of um, being misdiagnosed and in the August diagnosed with cancer. So that's a big shock to anyone, any family. And this big strong man was diagnosed with cancer. And we were like, do you know what, it's fine. He'll sort this. He's going to fight this, no bother. There was never any question of daddy not making it through this. But um, he was getting on with his treatment and no bother to him. And then we got the shock of our lives on the 9th of October 2013 when Daddy didn't come home one day. He was out fencing on a farm and um, Mam was sitting at home worried. I came home from school with Nora, my younger sister, and Mam was there worried. And I was like, what's wrong with you? And she says, oh, Daddy hasn't come home yet for his dinner. And I was like, oh, he's talking to someone. He's, you know, he's off somewhere. Uh, he'll be back soon. Will you, will you quit worrying? So I went off to my grinds. I was in my leaving cert at the time. I was 16. Um, French grinds and thought no more about it came back and mam was still worrying and I was like right we're going to have to start ringing his friends and that seemed like the most bizarre thing to be doing I was like hello is daddy witchy like and you know but then we just kind of started realizing okay something is wrong he's not answering the car hasn't come home um, and then very quickly our neighbors and our community we kind of got a few people together and there was just a bit of a search like because the car was left at the entrance to the field if that makes any sense so mm -hmm. We were um, concerned Daddy would never leave the car like that. He, was, he wasn't the kind of person that would, you know, wander off. He didn't carry a phone, so there was no contact to ring. And um, our worst nightmares came true that day when we found out that Daddy had suffered a heart attack and he had passed away. And um, then we were just hit with this reality of this is actually happening. We have to deal with this now. We had to, there was two, two sisters, Lorraine and Nicola, in college in Letterkenny. Michelle, the eldest girl, had to make a phone call and say, you need to come home, something has gone wrong. And the girls made their travel home and we didn't know whether to tell them, we didn't know. But you're 16. We were 16, yeah, I was okay. 16. Michelle was 22, which is my age now. Mm. I can't imagine You're only 22 to, now, you're still a child. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> but you were 16, you were doing your leaving Yeah, search. yeah, you were in the middle of grinds. Anyone with a student that's in leaving cert knows that it's the only thing anyone talks about for that whole year is, oh, how's your grinds going? When's your orals? When's this, I said you that, what subjects are you doing? So I was in the middle of all that. We had just lost daddy. We, um, then mammy, began to kind of lose weight. This was from October 2013 until Christmas time. Now let's just contextualize your family first, because uh, oh, yeah. you, know, you were a very close, loving family. Yeah, absolutely. And your mammy and daddy were obviously very much in love. And they were best friends. Your mammy, yeah. your daddy was 51. Yeah. Your mammy was what age? She was 51 then by the time she passed away on us as well. Oh, tell us how you discovered your mum. Well, we were, the four gir eldest girls worked in Kilrone and Castle, the Simmers Common, and we were, as Christmas time was so busy, we were doing a, a shift, and we came back to our auntie's house, as we always did for Christmas. You know, you try and get the light in these situations and celebrate Christmas, because it was important to us. 
And we walked in and Mam was kind of sitting with her back to us and the four of us looked and we were like, oh my God, she has lost so much weight. Like, what's happening? And then it, it very quickly became clear. Mam you thought was this was, her, she was part of the grieving we process? We thought this was grief. She had lost her best friend. She was in the house and she, she loves her country music, Charlie. Um, but she was listening to every song and she said, the happy songs make me sad. The sad songs make me sad. She was lost. Like she, was, she asked me a few times, what do I do? And I was like, I don't know what to say to you. You've lost your best friend. I couldn't imagine. So January came and Mam went into hospital and she spent basically the next nine months in hospital with her cancer treatment. And um, we, she came out, in fairness to her now, she, she made it out for Keith's confirmation in May. She was out for my exams. She, um, on the night of my debs, that was the last night that Mammy was at home. And she actually held on for that. Yeah. She was in pictures with us. And um, I have them pictures framed. We all, you know, do. We all got pictures together. And then that night I was on the bus to the debs. Everyone was having the crack. We were there in our dresses and we were having a few f- seven-ups. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> Sligo girls night. drink seven-up at that age, all right, Jay, okay, we we'll leave that one, Delicious. okay, do the <laughs> Enjoying our night, and I remember texting home and just being like, how's Mammy? This was a regular between us all. I don't think we had a group chat at the time, but we were texting, texting constantly. Everyone wanted to know and keep be kept up on what was happening. So Mammy and Lorraine, my sister, had gone in, and they were in, they were gone back into hospital, and Mam was back in again. So um, it was very quickly after that, that um, she was she was getting sicker and it was coming up to October and it was Daddy's year anniversary and we were like, will she make it out to this now? Will she make it to the mass for us? And she did, in fairness to her. And I think the community then maybe seen uh, that Mam was Mam was getting sicker and we were you know we were going to lose her. I think was kind of the reality at that stage. And it came then just a month later to the 16th of November and. We were all around Mammy. We were all in the room. We were singing the night before with her. We were, everyone was there, aunties, uncles, cousins. We took over the oncology. You know, there's a family room there, and thank God there is. And to the family, I know they're, they're I think they're from Jamshambo family that have that room. Thank you to them. It was our home for that few days, and we were all together, and we were around Mammy's bed when she, you know, she left us. She took her last breath, and we were devastated. We thought to ourselves, like, how are we going to go through this again? How are we going to sit in the funeral home with our black clothes on us and try and hide our tears? And do you know, there's humour in it all as well because Nora sat here. We sat in the row of ages, and I, Nora asked me, would I give her a nudge if it was going to be a sore handshake? <laughs> if it was going to be a real sincere grip because her hand was broke. <laughs> and so I'd get the oh, and I'd give Nora a nudge, and she'd give out the other hand. <laughs> going on for hours like and you know what you just we laugh about these things now and we just you know so we said our goodbye to mammy after thir- th- daddy had passed and we had 13 months then with mammy and in those 13 months we got to know her we all had our moments with her she had the different things that she talked to each one of us about like for me I was kind of maybe decorating the grave so that was something me and her would talk about um, she wanted Nicola, she had a few things to organise with Nicola with regards to like being a guardian for Keith and different things like that. Lorraine had her different stories with her, Nora, Michelle, you know, all of us, Keith, her baby Keith. <laughs> um, we asked her towards the end, myself and Nicola, is there anything you want? Is there anything you want us to do? Anything you need? No, you'll be fine. I have faith in ye. You. You'll mind Keith. And that, I think, was the most heartwarming thing that she wasn't scared, you know, she just wanted to go and be with daddy and she had her time done and her sickness and she got her release you know so we were so happy to a certain extent that her pain was over but also devastated for ourselves um, but you, you, you were I'm just trying to get my head around it um, you know I don't think many people can get their heads around this kind of a 16 year old kid doing her leaving cert loses daddy then loses her mummy yeah. um, and then you like how did you hold the family together? Where did the strength come from to hold you as this really tight, cohesive unit? Now, I, I'm sure the, the, obvi- the answer is very obvious, oh, but yeah. I'm just asking probably a stupid question. But. I think there's so many answers to that, but the main one is community. Our local community and the surrounding areas, they fundraised for us, they looked out for us, a neighbour still drops in a chicken curry on a Sunday. <laughs> I heard um, this, and she still drops the chicken curry. Still does. Sinead, he, what happens if somebody develops a problem with eating chicken curry? Do well, you just no, put it in the bin? Or we can't we... eat lasagna anymore. 
lasagna is gone. Why <laughs> because too many? Because of the amount of lasagna. <laughs> but no, we're still going with the chicken curry. You <laughs> talked about your local priest as well. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Father uh, O'Shea. The other day, but you know, and that's that is something that in the postmodern. Uh, super society that we yeah. live in. It's not cool to talk about priests no, or anything like that. No, it's not. But what you're talking about is really good, old-fashioned, uh, homogenous relationships. Absolutely, yeah. Like, which defies the concept yeah. of modernity or late modernity. Mm -hmm. You are saying it's the old relationships, yeah. the old neighbourhoods. The stable the old, people the, you've grown yeah. up with. That, uh, that, that priest that we're talking about, um, only Bar Michelle christened us all. You know, he, he was amazing. Him and Mam used to text because he had suffered his own sickness and himself and Mammy would text and she, she, when she was out, would drop him fruit because <laughs> she thought if, if he was making smoothies, he was getting his nutrition in. Like, this is Mammy. That's what Mammy was. But um, it's the community. It's the support. It's our own family. It's our aunties and our neighbours. And um, one Auntie Breege in particular, our mam's sister. Is she here tonight? She's here, I think. Auntie Breege, big shout out to you. Where are you? <laughs> Say hello to us. Where is she? Where is she? Stand up. <laughs> There's Auntie Without Breach, problem. ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Giva. From Air. Oh, Mayo, she's, she's drum Mayo. Air, the story. Sorry, I, she probably originally said, was she from Mayo? Sorry. Oh, no, oh. she's drum Air. Oh, drum Air. Sorry, I thought she said Mayo. <laughs> Apologies, you're one of ours. Yeah, she is. Without Breach, Breach held us all together. But you as said as something as well rentals. that uh, I was very taken by. And I was, I was taken by the fact that your brother was the youngest, he was 12. Keith was 12 when we lost Daddy. Your oldest sibling was 22. Yeah. You were 16. Now, I have a 24-year-old daughter, and I have a 30-year-old son, and I still think of them as two little babies, yeah, and they still <laughs> act as if they're two little babies. <laughs> but what I was really, really stirred by was that you said that you guys sat down and took the very mature, thought-out decision that we are not going to make our younger brother feel, we're not going to mammy him, yeah. we're not going to daddy him. Yeah. We're, going to, he's, we're going to be his siblings because his mommy and daddy are gone yeah. and we will never replace them. No, there was never going but to what be. What is incredible about that, and I'm sure everybody here would agree with, the level of maturity that is almost supernatural almost. Yeah. You, you, I, I may, I'm trying, probably being too dramatic as years of being a bleeding tabloid hack but, <laughs> but it was so striking that you guys made that decision and, yeah. I, I, and you can speak about it in such a mature and brave way like you, you make the rest of us feel like we're a bunch of cowards oh no I think for Keith you know we, we kind of always we nearly go oh what do we need to do for him Keith is amazing like he never made anything hard for us he got up for school he never he did his homework he never made any hassle for us the crack that we have with that book <laughs> but the thing about it is it's, it's, it's like you're obviously clearly you had a brilliant brilliant Raring. mother and father oh absolutely yeah you are we in, owe them everything you've like. got their genes you've got yeah. their love you've got their they, vibe but they the put fact the hard work that, in but it's, it's like, I think it's the incredible sense of how difficult it must have been uh, and how resilient you really had to be to sit down and do his homework every day yeah. and for you to be his sister and you to carry your load as well. Yeah, we were all in our own ways, but you know what? We had our days when we had our tea around the table and we talked, we talked about it. I talked about my experience. Lorraine gave her... Uh, series of events, Nicola gave her part and we just helped each other. No one of us closed out the door, no one of us went to work and came home and sat in our rooms by ourselves. We were together and I think that was the most important thing is that we helped each other, like the girls are all here tonight. Are they here as well? Where yeah, are they? Our whole crew came. We oh, the whole lot of you, stand up, we want to have a look at you. Which one's only Auntie Bride <laughs> was here, me. that's all. Stand up, where are you? Come on, stand Not up, girls. Stand up. There they are, they're all beautiful too. Look at them, hello girls. <laughs> Welcome to Carrick and Shannon. They're going to kill me. <laughs> You're brilliant. <laughs> I know, but... Um, There's no jealousy in that house either. Oh, I there is say. jealousy. Oh, oh, there. oh there, we're they're sisters. Saying, who the hell does she think she's oh, up on no, that bleeding that stage? Way, no, all that. We're sisters at the end of the day. We do kill each other. Like, this is Lorraine's oh, just, dress. Nora did my makeup. Over the road, like. <laughs> 
have to be we serious like about it. So to be sort of like and like initially we had to figure out how four or five girls were going to run a house and who got to put their load of washing in first. And if the rack was taken up, why are your clothes still on the rack? And I know, would presume that would be where the old sort of hierarchical structure come in. <laughs> no, if the didn't. younger one has to make sure that the clothes are out in the line. <laughs> There was none of that. We just tried our best to find our roles within each other and help. Like, But you know what? It's a fun house. They built us a beautiful home. They, they got us... In, the, in a way, we were ready for this. We were all independent. We were told, get your car, get a job, um, do this, do that. You know, as in, we were just brought up in a way that... in. But you're My saying your mum and dad instilled these us, values yeah. in you from the Absolutely. time you were babies. Oh, God, yeah, the from the very start. Up. Like, do you know, mum's worth ethic and dad's, like, daddy, um, unbelievable. Like, you know, and we're, we're at the stage now when we're looking back and, like, we found an old diary of mammies and we're reading, I was working here, I went there, that, the other, and we're like, I would love to just talk to them. I would love to just find out, you know, talk to them now and ask them what were you like when you were my age, ask them the questions because the teenage years you go and you don't care, you're in and out and mum will always be there and dad will always be there but the case is no, cherish that relationship, put down the phone, I see so many people stuck on the phone and mum's over there and they're not engaging and I'm just like cherish that relationship and like when the phone calls, I know I'd be in college sometimes and the girls would be like oh mum's ringing again, I'd be sitting there answer the call like mum wants to talk to you you know <laughs> But um, each, each, everyone has their own relationships with their parents, but like, they're still with us, they still guide us in so many ways, and you know, the days when you get an exam result, or the days when something goes well for you, if the girls are playing football and there's a, a match, you know, they were at every single match, they, you know, they, do, they were do, there. Do like, you find yourself praying to them? Oh, oh yeah, in my own Mom, way. Mum, give me a dig like, out here. Oh yeah, Dad, absolutely. give me a dig out here. But we have a song, and um, it's Wake Me Up by Avicii. And there's a connection to it because the night before daddy died, um, dad, if you were playing your, your pop or whatever it was at the time, you'd be told, turn off that. That was no, no good. Yeah, it had to be Ocean FM, it had to be Midwest, and it had to be country. So, no Shannon side, no? Oh, well, maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, only, <laughs> but, I'm trying to get a plug in for Finnegan. That's not a good, continue, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> but um, so Avicii, Nora was playing it on her phone, and daddy actually said, Jesus, that's a good song. And you know what? Avicii, he's passed since actually, oh my God, but. Um, Daddy liked that song and we were shocked for it and he asked to play it again and Mammy was saying, turn that off and Daddy said, no, play it. This was the night before we lost him. And ever since, if there's something going on, that song plays for us. It's so bizarre, it's the most strange thing, but it's a sign from them. Like if, I, I can't remember now the specifics, but like different times when you'd be going for something important or something has happened, the song will play for you and you're just reminded like, yeah, they're here with us, we're, we're gonna be fine, but you know. There must have been an awful lot floods and floods and floods of tears oh absolutely and there still is you know yeah. this last week of kind of reliving the years has been extremely sensitive but it's so lovely and the messages of support that we've received on social media and just different friends messaging us and saying you know what you have gone through so much um, we, you know we're so proud of you the amount of people have said they're proud of us it's amazing like you know I think everybody here is very proud of you everybody is very proud of you you're wonderful um, one of the things uh, coming from the country and w w like we see those dreadful dreadful tragedies like the three kids the three babies oh yeah who went to out for St Paddy's night I looked back on Facebook um, these memories come up and I seen a picture of myself and Nicola at our disco eight years ago and I thought to myself we got to go out and have our fun and our night and those poor young people they, they just got, you know, their lives were taken so short. They didn't get to enjoy their night and the cruelty of it all, but their families will find some strength in the support that is going to be around them and the community because in these situations, you think, we're never going to get over this. But people flock together and people support and take every piece of support. Like, everyone in this room is going to experience loss and tragedy in their lives or downtimes, as the fellow speakers have talked about, that there is down periods. The supports are available. Open up your eyes, take them on board, and use them, and you'll be so much better off. But that's for something it. that has always, <clears> through <throat> the years, I, I recall many, many years ago, a um, a dad who succumbed to suicide in uh, Carrigallen, and uh, I was very, very young at the time, and I was going to school with the kids, yeah. and there was no talking about this, and I always remembered it sticking in my mind is what are they going through? What's it like for them? Yeah. And, like, and that's the thing that brings communities together when 
the babies lose their mommy and daddy, yeah. especially with you guys who's your mommy and daddy. Like, what would you say to kids, or do you communicate with kids who find themselves in similar situations as you did? I would love to have the outlet to talk to people that are going through this because the amount of years that have passed, and we're only now kind of realising that was so traumatic. You're so on autopilot, you're so in the middle of it. If I met someone and they were going through it as well, I would say don't beat yourself up about the fact that there might have been rows and there might have been, you might have maybe got on as well because you were a teenager and you knew everything. Look at the positives. Look at the, I'm privileged I had 16 years with my dad. I'm privileged I had 17 years with Mammy. The girls are as well. We're, we're delighted for the time we had with them and the memories and the fun we had, you know, like, you know. But you know, that, that, that truly is extraordinary on so many levels, that view. I have a, a, a relation who would say, you guys have been here before. You're <laughs> wise beyond your years, you know. Yeah. I think you're absolutely brilliant. Thank I'm glad I listened to you on the radio today because I got over my little teary, leaky eye <laughs> thing, so I don't have to do it now. You are brilliant. And we said tonight this was going to be an inspiring night. Everybody who's spoken is inspiring, but I have to say even the most inspiring speakers here tonight would say you are number one tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. Give her a big round of applause. Yes. Let me give you a... Can you sit down and take the bow? You're brilliant. Well done. Oh, my God. Now...